Uh, tonight we have an amazing panel. So again, the event is called How I Got Here. Uh, and each of the panelists are going to do an introduction on themselves and kind of who they are and why they're on the panel. Starting with? Yeah, we're going to start with Ben down here. We're going to move all the way uh, my right to your left or your left to your right. Hi, folks. <clears throat> my name is Ben Callahan. I'm the president of Sparkbox. Uh, we're based in Dayton, Ohio. We have an office in Pittsburgh as well, and we have a lot of remote folks. Um, I'm trying to think what's important to share here. Um, I'm the president of that company, and I'm also one of the owners and founders. Um, we have about 45 folks. Um, we do a lot of custom software engineering. So, Hey, guys. Again, Lindsay Gast with Tech Systems, a recruiter here locally. Um, so I help support right around 100 clients in Columbus, anything from, you know, a big Fortune 100 company to smaller agencies. Um, so got a great... Great city here and lots of opportunity in Columbus. So probably been going to web group about four years now. Um, I came to learn more myself and kind of built a relationship. So thanks for having me. I'm Kevin Terry Smith. I am solidly not in tech, but um, I founded a gender equal clothing line called Ollie Awake and I work for um, Ohio, one of the nation's largest LGBTQ plus health systems, Equitas Health. Hello, my name is Laura Jackson. I lead product management at an early stage startup called Script Drop. We actually just recently won Growth Stage Company over the year for the year in Ohio over Root and Beam. Um, so, uh, no, I like Root. Stop, everybody. Um, no, so <laughs> that's me. I am a ex organizer for CWG RIP to my tenure here. Um, and I sit on the board for the Create Columbus Commission. So we're essentially a group of individuals from all different sectors of the city. Don't test me on this. And um, we focus on making sure that we can create a wonderful grants program as well as just creating a space for young professionals to co-create within the city of Columbus. So this year we're focusing on affordable housing and public art. And we just had an event the other night where we gave out 20K to um, young professionals in the city. I'm Timothy Wolfstar. I'm one of the managing directors at Atlas Partners. We are cheerleaders for Columbus and all of our sibling cities around us throughout the country. We bring in money and we bring in jobs and we get to brag about all the amazing work that all of you do uh, day in and day out. Uh, I'm also a semi-retired festival producer that is trying to be a fully retired festival producer, but a lot of you keep pulling me back into that. So keep trying not to. Thank you. Hi, thank you for having me here. My name is Ray Chen, and I am the emerging technology lead at the neighboring insurance company. Thank you, Ru, for having me here. Um, I work at Grange Insurance, and uh, thank you. <laughs> um, so the reason why I'm here outside of my um, daytime job, I also um, volunteer and organize lots of hackathons, um, you name it, in Columbus, Startup Weekend, Give Back Hack, and also we um, found a, a new one called Develop Appalachian. So um, there are tons of stuff I, I want to share that you could do outside of your daytime job and lots of people help and we will go into more um, detail on that. Hi everyone, my name is Kyle Skinner. I'm a student athlete at The Ohio State University and I am here because this summer I got to direct the film Test City USA, which Kevin was featured in. Um, and so I'm here to talk about that. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Adam Albrecht. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, let's see, I'm a software engineer, which I, I did independently, doing independent consulting for a long time. And then in recent years, I've kind of dipped my toe into the, the startup world and have helped start two tiny software companies, uh, Next Chapter and Compliance Pro. And yeah. Hello, 
last but not least, me. Uh, my name is Sean, um, Patrick, John, Paul, George, Ringo, Duran, it would happen eventually. Um, and I work at a place called Aware. We used to be called Wiretap, um, but we changed it for um, some reasons. It's less scary. Um, just a, another brag, I guess. We were uh, best places to work. I don't know what category, but we are a best place to work. Um, it's an, <laughs> yeah. Um, but we are an enterprise SaaS uh, company that does uh, helps companies uh, deploy collaboration and communication tools like Slack and Skype and Workplace or Yammer, anything like that. Um, and the reason I'm here is probably because Kevin knows me. That's one. Um, also, Kevin was one of the first people that I met while I was trying to get into you know, tech stuff, UI, UX, um, while I was still in college. So like, I went to Columbus Web Group, attended, met Kevin, and then became an organizer eventually, got my first job within Cardinal, and then sort of escalated from there. So I've been through some stuff. Sure. Yeah, that's it. Great. Um, well, uh, thank you, everyone, for kind of sharing where you got started and you, a little bit about yourself. Um, so we're, we're here to talk about how I got here. So I was kind of wondering if, uh, Laura, maybe you could start by talking about what your childhood was like. Or start from all the way at the beginning. Oh. <laughs> Is everyone ready? No, I'm kidding. Um, so the little bits that I will share tonight, um, I think the importance of why I'm sharing it is the, at the end of the day, the lesson out of all of this is that I had a very unique childhood and something that if you look at me, no one would guess. Um, and so I think it has evolved with me throughout my career to understand like listening to other people and trying to have a little bit of a different sense of empathy. So my childhood was very different. So I, um, my mom was an immigrant. She came from Indonesia and my dad was black and we lived in rural West Virginia. And so like talk about like sticking out, right? Um, so my mom was like this gorgeous long hair Indonesian little lady. And then, um, my family was ex-military. So we were just a little bit different, um, <laughs> to say the least. And um, then my parents got divorced, so I kind of just grew up with just my dad. So, like, my whole upbringing was very um, isolated in the sense that no one looked like me. And um, that relationship with a mom is very, like, in society is what is very normal. So as a female being raised by a single father, I think, is very unconventional. So... Um, you know, I can bail hay, I can like ride horses. Um, I've been to every continent in the world though, except for Antarctica. So I grew up with a father who um, traveled the world a lot, was very educated, but I definitely like grew up in a very rural part of uh, society that has a very linear way of thinking. Um, and then I went to Ohio State and because my dad got his PhD here, and I have lived in Columbus ever since. So that's just like a little peek into what my childhood is like. And so you can only imagine. What I think is really cool is the people that know me today, even the people on this panel, like Kevin and Sean are probably some of my earliest friends in the city and love and know me very dearly. I tell them a lot of crazy stories, and sometimes... I will like drunk text them some really gibberish stuff, but like most people that know me don't know how wild and crazy I used to be. And now when you meet me now, you're like, oh, we're so like professional and poised. Um, I just had a really crazy childhood. I'll just say that. Well, thanks for sharing. Well, I'm yeah. gonna add one thing to when I first met Laura. Uh, it was actually Sean and I went to a, a conference in Springfield, Ohio. Yeah, and she was one of the organizers, and we, we showed up like three hours early, uh, and it was like 6.30 in the morning, and she was there working, and she was like, well, we're not ready for you guys, and I was like, well, I'm presenting. She's like, all right, well, you guys can sit over there, but then she made sure, like, she went above and beyond to make sure that we were having a good time, even though we shouldn't have been there, like, we should have just left and come back to Columbus and then back again, but uh, one of the big takeaways with that was just, like, 
how much she cared about everyone that she came in contact with and any interaction after that, it wasn't just her organizing event at networking. She's not afraid to speak out and introduce herself to someone new. And that's like a key takeaway for who Laura is. And you're Uh, awesome. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, Kyle, you're, you're one of the younger panelists. You're still, um, in school at a certain university in town, and uh, go Flyers. And so I was kind of wondering if you could all ex- expand a little bit about what your childhood was like. Yeah, so I also had kind of a different childhood, similar actually in a sense. I grew up on a small organic farm in the middle of California. So California, you think of beaches and warm weather, I had pretty much the exact opposite experience. I lived 30 minutes away from the nearest grocery store and like a five minute drive from the nearest neighbors. So growing up was very different from what most people experienced. And then in high school, I moved to a city, not quite like this one, but a small city where I really learned to kind of put the connections that I had made growing up in nature and observing the world around me to the test with making friends and developing networking connections. And so when I was trying to figure out what college I wanted to go to, I was looking at a bunch of different schools. Where can I play volleyball? Where can I get a good education? And I was speaking about this earlier I heard about Ohio State and their volleyball team, got in touch with the coaches, and within that next week, somehow three people with Ohio State gear in a small town in California walked into the place that I worked in. I was like, holy shit, like, I need to go to Ohio State. Like, this school is everywhere. Like, these people are all around me. And so that was kind of a wake up call for me. Like, the networking that Ohio State has is just amazing. Um, so, uh, obviously you're in college, um, could you, you know, touch a little bit briefly on kind of what you're studying, that kind of, yeah. Yeah, so I am a film studies major, I'm studying how to make movies, um, and that led me to the internship that I got this summer with Jay Klaus making a documentary on entrepreneurship in Columbus. And I had no experience on entrepreneurship, like didn't really know what I was getting myself into. Um, But studying film studies really brought me into this community here. And it won the best Ohio made film of the year at the Columbus Film Festival. (laughs) Yes, congratulations, that's a fantastic. So as we kind of talk a little bit about entrepreneurship, I know Adam, you're kind of, you're an entrepreneur, you have, um, you mentioned a couple of different firms. Could you kind of expand on like what your sort of college um, situation was and whether you went or not? Sure. Um, Yeah, I I went to college. I went to Miami University um, and and, uh, I studied computer science and I, I had a minor in entrepreneurship. It was always something that was in the back of my mind. And so um, after working just like a regular job for a few years, I was like looking for my neck, like the way I could start to to move in that direction. And uh, I mean, sorry, this isn't totally answering your question, but, uh, (laughs) and my answer to that was to like do independent work, live as cheaply as humanly possible, and um, just look for opportunities everywhere around me and hang out with the right people. And um, it, it, you know, it turned out, it, it turned out for the best. So it worked. Yeah, there seems to be a very strong entrepreneurship theme on the panel. Um, so uh, Tim, could you kind of expand on what your first job was? Yeah, um, my first job was cleaning toilets at a church because I thought I wanted to become a minister. I I thought I did, Um, but mostly I wanted to because I wanted to support community. And growing up in the short north, way before it was the cool short north that we all know and love now, 
um, the place that was the home for my aunts and uncles that were struggling to find acceptance with their families and with their loved ones was this church. And so the only way that I could support it was to clean their toilets. So I did that for several years and then delivered flyers and then got into corporate America. Then I quit that same time I quit school and started painting driveways black, hanging Christmas lights and pushing concrete trucks all around the country. Wow, I wasn't expecting all of that. <laughs> uh, so as you're kind of talking about the struggle um, when people have their first job, uh, Ray, could you expand on that a little bit? So um, I actually moved to United States and specific Columbus, Ohio when I was 25. And I, was, I finished a, a master's degree at Ohio State and got my first job in HR. So I know I had a really like zigzagging career from HR turning emerging tech person. Um, and I would say first job, what I learned is that definitely don't think you have to do that. Even if it, it's like something you set out to do, your major, what your major is, don't have your mindset Keep, uh, keep your mind really open and learn whatever opportunity comes. So I actually work with a lot of interns right now. A lot of times they have the um, idea that what they want to do is to strategize because that's what they learn at school. But oh, keep your mind open to get your hands dirty. So in my first job, I actually learned how to um, code like CSS and HTML that was like so 15, 20 years ago, not cool today, but that's actually turned me on into technology. So definitely keeping your mind open and I know you, you may struggle when you got assigned to the job you may not want to do, but take it on and view it as a challenge. Uh, so kind of on the, the topic of um, zigzagging and some of the early career, Laura, do you um, have any struggles that you might want to talk about kind of related to your first job? Um, I wouldn't say that, and don't take this in the wrong way, I wouldn't say that I've had struggles. I would say that um, I've always been really intentional with whatever job that I have because we only have one life. So as soon as I'm not happy, I leave. Um, and there's been lots of moments in my life where I've left a job, um, all the way from, I worked at a radio station intern when I was in college and I remember I have really bad asthma as well. And I had to, like, I could not breathe. And I was telling this guy, he was like, you have to do this gig tonight, blah, blah, blah. Like we're going out, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, what do you want me to do? Bring my nebulizer to the bar? And he was like, Yeah. That's what I want you to do. And I was like, this, I quit. So it's like, um, <laughs> I've had a lot of different jobs. I started working when I was 14 as a hostess at a Shoney's. Don't look up where I work, don't look up where I live, okay? But the Shoney's had like a hole in the ceiling and like cockroaches and the whole nine. Like that was my first job. And, um, you know, by the time I left my hometown, I actually ended up being what is called a server's assistant at a sports club. So I was serving the CEO of Exxon and like, you know, multi-billion dollar people, um, even just in my small town. So it was just like, even within that, um, just kind of continuously moving on. And um, I will say what I've learned out of all of that outside of the uncomfortableness of switching jobs is, Every organization there's at the head of the snake is where your leader is. So whoever's in leadership, always align with that person. That's going to be like your true north on if you can follow this person and if it's going to be a good fit for you. Um, I mean, it's crazy if I actually think about how many jobs I've had since I'm 14, since 14, and it's probably been like over 20 jobs, you know, if I count all the eight internships I had in college. So um, I've learned a shit ton about working with people and 
what makes me uncomfortable and just saying no. Um, so I don't, I wouldn't say it's a struggle. It's just like being very confident in that and not wavering. So kind of on the, um, so Ben, on the, so the topic of like you run a company, right? And, um, you know, through the, the different, jobs and some of like the internships and the early career stage um, type jobs. Um, could you kind of expand a little bit on like what you, uh, what your company ha does as far as like hiring interns or some of those early stage career jobs? Yeah, absolutely. I, w I love hearing about people's backgrounds, especially because this industry is full of people from so many different backgrounds. It's one of the things that I love about what we get to do is that there's people, we have people on our team who studied, who studied English, who studied biology, didn't go to school, um, you know, and I love that because that brings so many unique perspectives to the problems we're trying to solve. And so that sort of scrappiness is, I think, um, kind of at the core of what we look for when we're trying to find folks. And um, one of the programs we've had in place for the last eight or nine years, I would say, is an apprenticeship program. And this is um, similar maybe to an internship, but it's much more intense. Um, it's very, it's a, it's a full-time job. It's a paid position actually. Um, and it's a six month long paid apprenticeship where basically you're just, you come and learn. And we have a whole curriculum that we put you through. Um, you People apply from all over um, and move to our location to kind of do this with us. Um, they they basically learn everything they need to be a really good beginner, you know, full stack developer. Um, and so that program has been awesome for us as an organization because it sort of aligns with our values of education and continual learning. Um, and also, if you've ever had the opportunity to, to, to mentor or teach somebody who's really interested and passionate about a subject, you could probably also share that you learn a lot in that process. And so that process kind of keeps us sharp and it's been really, really a game changer for us. Fantastic. Can I add one, one thing to that? So from his apprenticeship, apprenticeship program, I actually hired one individual, and uh, Lauren Dorman, and she was absolutely amazing. And that program, you do two of them each year, and one's a more back end, one's a front end. Is that correct? Yeah, and actually the applications for that are open right now, and they're only going to be open for another a couple of days, I think that program it runs for the first six months of each year. That's the full stack developer one. So I'll try to um, use that hashtag and post a link if folks are interested. Yeah, but the folks at Sparkbox and the Build Right that you know Ben started is some of the best education that anyone can get. And it's not even it's free education, but it's also paid for. The people that come out of that program are all very very successful. It's literally amazing. And then I'm going to say one thing other about Ben. Uh, I think I, I've met a lot of people in my life and career, but Ben is probably one of the most influential people that I've ever met. We had a conversation like, it's probably like eight years ago. And at that time period, it was with my buddy, Tim Bonderlow. And we were kind of in this turning point in our career. And that single conversation, that dinner that we had, literally changed the perspective of where I was going and what I wanted to do for the rest of my career. And because of that, we started a bunch of companies, but it wasn't immediately after that. It was all the preparation that Ben talked about. So it wasn't like that take the leap idea. It was more like plan for it, be strategic, and plan out the business. And even from like how we thought about hiring and the people that we wanted to bring in and work with. So. Uh, I thank Ben for like where I am today. So Ben's awesome. Oh, I said awesome. <laughs> well, you are. You're all awesome. You get a chalkboard and just start keeping a tally. Yeah. It's, uh, stupid. So uh, Lindsay, being a, a technical recruiter, I'm, I'm sure you have a lot of you know tips, tricks, knowledge. Um, what is something, um, some advice you might give someone who's looking to land that first? internship, apprenticeship, or kind of entry level career, like as they're leaving college maybe, or some other type of kind of first stepping stone in their career? Yeah, I know we've all been there. Um, it can it can be hard, it can be intimidating, um, not really knowing where to start. And I think just 
realizing that's okay. It's okay to feel that way. Um, I would say everybody in this room, um, I don't know if first jobs, you know, second jobs, 20th job, whatever it is, you guys are all doing the right things. Um, I would say going to events, um, putting yourself out there and, and kind of speaking up on, hey, this is what I want to do. Um, you know, we're not nobody's a mind reader. Um, I think just networking and really putting yourself out there. And even sometimes I actually think of every job I've gotten and I feel like it's somehow through someone I've known, but maybe not a close friend, even it could be, you know, an event you, you volunteered at, but you, you got to know, you know, who was running it or who was leading it. Um, and really putting yourself out there. So I would say doing what you're doing now, um, building those relationships, asking the right questions. Um, but then even figuring out, you know, kind of doing your research, if there is a company you're really passionate about, you know, don't be afraid, you know, even if there isn't an opening necessarily, you know, kind of putting yourself out there, even we have great technology these days, even if it's LinkedIn, you know, reaching out to somebody and saying, Hey, I, I would love your job one day. Do you mind if I, you know, buy you a cup of coffee or, or shadow you, you know, um, I, don't, I feel like people don't do enough of that. Um, and if you can figure out anything else about the company, kind of peel back some of those layers to figure out, you know, even if it's not professional experience you have, but if you can connect those dots of, Hey, I've done very similar things at, you know, X, Y, Z, even if it was a side project, it was freelance, it was volunteering through my school. Um, I think you can connect a lot of dots that way and just make sure you're not, you know, underselling yourself, undervaluing yourself. Um, we've all been there. So those would be a few things I think could, could help. Awesome. Uh, I said awesome. Uh, um, so you're rubbing off. So, uh, Kevin, you, um, you started your own, um, clothing company and I'm really, I'd like to, to learn a little bit more about like what sort of led up to that and where your career took you from doing whatever you were doing before to starting that. Yeah. So, um, Ollie Awake started as something that I really did not see in the market when I was looking for things that I wanted to wear, um, which is probably how a lot of new businesses are started in the world. A problem is observed because it's something that's directly impacting the person who wants to start something new. At the time, I wanted to open my own um, gender neutral boutique in the short north. And I went through this whole long process of learning how to run a store, which was like horrible. Um, and, but then I realized that there, the pieces that I would even be, um, stocking, they weren't aligning with what I wanted. And at the time I had shared my idea with, um, Celeste Malvar Stewart, who's a very well-known designer here in town. And she was like, okay, that's all really great about the store. If you ever want to do your own line, like I can help connect you to, and this is a whole lesson about like networking and working connections because I met Celeste because I knew someone else that was really close with her and we had just developed that relationship. Um, and then when I realized I wanted to start with my own line, which Kevin at the time, I had just talked to Kevin about this right when I was about to dive into this. And I was like, I need to learn how to like make clothes. And he was like, oh God, that sounds horrible. <laughs> I don't know how you would do that or how that would go. Um, and I, I don't think that was my <laughs> advice to you at all. <laughs> Kevin asked a lot of really, really hard questions that made me like, he was like, what is the brand? I'm like, oh my God, I don't know how to make clothes. So, um, but I ended up having lunch with Celeste and she was like, well, if I do this then blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh my God, you're telling me that you will be the one to do this. And we actually ended up partnering and now she's part of the company and it's been really great. But that was just kind of the launching point that started, started everything off. Yeah. Uh, so you you know kind of you talked a little bit about brand, and um, we also have another panelist, Sean, who you've done a lot of work with the branded aware, and so I think that brand is a, a big part of you know any company. So can you talk a little bit about kind of like what led you into sort of the, the design aspect and the branding aspect of what you're doing now? Curveball. Uh... I didn't do anything with the Aware brand. I'm not even doing design, technically. Um, I was hired at, when it was Wiretap, as like the first designer. Um, 
which was nice. I knew the CEO and lots of the people I worked with before at Nationwide. Um, and I was doing marketing stuff as well as product stuff. Um, and my background was more, um, I don't know, mishmash of everything. Uh, <laughs> I am being so modest, I guess. Um, but it was a mishmash of everything. And I didn't know like what I liked since I've my whole life has just been everything. Um, and as time went on and the company grew from, I think it was like employee number 12 or I don't think it was 13, I remember that. Um, from that to uh, around 30-ish people, um, my time slowly became more and more marketing focused and less and less product focused. And uh, I slowly, as time went on, realized I hated uh, the marketing aspect of things um, and really would wanted to get back into like the product side of stuff. Um, and luckily, like around December of last year, or January of this year, um, I made the switch from just design marketing stuff to um, front end developer designer. So now I'm touching the back end. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, it's, re it's really nice because now it, I feel like I'm doing what I wanted to do and using like the design skills, but applying that to like a product focused engineering aspect. Um, so to answer your question, I can't answer your question. Um, so, so I'm going to jump in here uh, because when I met Sean, uh, he was in that position of where so many people are when they're trying to start off their career, where he was super talented, super skilled, but he didn't have the resume and the portfolio to get hired. And I met Sean through Startup Weekend, and hackathons are some of the best places on earth to get portfolio pieces, network, and meet people. Uh, majority of my friends go to them and we all enjoy them. We're either mentors, we're going to them and I met so many awesome people. Met Sean there and he was telling me like he couldn't get a job and I didn't understand that. And I was like, well, I, you know, in my position at my, at one of the jobs I worked at, I was like, well, we're looking for someone. So I was like, come in, send your resume. And he's like, oh, it's not really that good. Uh, Cause he was working for marketing for, you know, a single shop individual. And it, the portfolio was not, it was actually really bad. And it did not represent like him as a person. I was like, come in and explain to us about your design concepts. So I'm gonna ask Sean about that in a second. But Sean actually came in and interviewed and everyone said no. They said he does not have the, the background, he does not have the history to do this. I already knew this. I, it's not a shock. Yeah. Like I knew that everyone didn't like it. <laughs> yeah, and we we had internal talks, and I was like, "No, Sean is super talented." And they're like, "All right, we'll give him a shot." So he came in as a very junior individual, but it, in my mind, he was very senior. He just had a shit portfolio. Um, it was really bad. Yeah, it was really bad. <laughs> I, I I don't even know if I had. It was just a collection oh, of it like was bad. Like, JPEGs and PDFs. Yeah, it's crappy. I'll post I've it. never had a portfolio ever since that point. I didn't even like. <laughs> so I can't even tell. If you need portfolio advice, do not come to me. If you want to interview advice, I, yeah. I'm probably not even the best person either because I've gotten all my jobs just by knowing a person. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> so what Sean did, though, this is what's incredible about Sean, and he is. I don't know. He, he doesn't like speaking about himself, but anyone that knows Sean knows he's super talented. Uh, he showed up early every single day and we were coming in the office around seven. Sean would be in the office at seven. We'd be leaving around eight o'clock. Sean would be still there at eight o'clock. If we went to the bar and drank, Sean would still be back in the office. Uh, he would ask us questions, really great questions. We give him answers next night or next morning you come into work ask additional questions and he kept learning about this. He had a podcast and a blog about his learnings. And then he went literally, in, uh, so fast forward the story, in about a three month time frame, Sean went from someone that wasn't qualified for us to being one of our most senior UX designers and developers. And he interviewed as a designer and he became one of our best developers. It was absolutely incredible. So. I don't know what question I have for Sean, but maybe speak about like maybe the work that you did in that interview process in the early days. 
Oh, okay. Cardinal. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's a better question. Okay. <laughs> for you. <laughs> this is going all over the place. It's weird. That you're just gushing all over me. I, know. I, um, I like you. Yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, I I get addicted to things. Um, luckily, not no substances or anything. Just crack. Just crack. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but no, for real, like I, I do have an addictive personality. Um, and I know that ever since like high school, I played Halo 2 way too much. Um, I challenge anyone, I would beat you. Um, very confident in that answer. Um, and then I almost died in a car crash. And then I looked back at my life and like, oh, wow. Do I want to be remembered as, oh, wasn't that the kid that was really good at Halo 2? <laughs> Just like, ah, yeah. So uh, at that point in time, I was like, OK, I know that I can get like obsessed over things. And I might as well like turn that into like focus that direction on good stuff. Um, so that's what I've been doing ever since then, just like learning, because that, I don't know, comes naturally to me, and then asking questions, and then getting my hands dirty, um, just like using as many free resources as possible, like uh, lynda.com. It's really good, really free from the Columbus Public Library. You just sign up for an account, and it's professional stuff. You don't have to pay. Um, but yeah, doing all that stuff, and then working at Cardinal, and nationwide, just getting in the trenches, not doing, not knowing what you're doing, just npm install. I don't know what the hell is happening. Downloading node modules and uh, sketch and learning design systems and type and hierarchy. And because at OSU, I learned about um, like human computer interaction. No design, real stuff is more psychological and theoretical st stuff. Um, so ever since then, I've just been trying to get my hands dirty, actually doing stuff and then learning from that. And then also finding someone to mentor you. So like Kevin really helped me out and then ever since then just asking tons of questions around the people around you. And if no one around you knows your answer, you probably should find some people or the internet. Um, but people are usually faster, especially because they know the context of what you're asking from. Uh, well, the internet is just to uh, get lots of random examples that might not pertain to your exact situation and sort of details. Last thing I'll add is we, he did a weekend workshop for Columbus Web Group. It's actually one of the highest uh, playback videos that we've done. Sean's an amazing mentor and teacher, and I always make him teach for us all the time for free. Uh, so you can learn a lot from Sean. So, I mean, it sounds like the, you put a high value of importance on getting your hands dirty, and you talked a little bit about hackathons. So I know Ray also um, has done a lot of work with those. Can you talk about like uh, sort of what you think the importance of like actually doing and um, getting your hands dirty during a hackathon um, and how that relates to a career? So as I mentioned, um, I'm kind of addicted to hackathons. <laughs> and um, Kevin also mentioned um, Startup Weekend is a great way to meet lots of um, people that are very talented, very driven, and if you haven't been to one, there will be one coming up in November. It's on November, November 15th, actually at Root Insurance. So definitely sign up. I don't know, I think they're building a new space, and so that's a new revealing place. So nobody has been to that yet, and definitely signed up for that. But my experience with um, Hackathon is definitely starting with Startup Weekend. It was around four years ago. I was graduating from MBA and also have a full-time job. And I feel like if I graduate from MBA, I probably have too much free time in my hand. So I joined the Startup Weekend and I met a whole bunch of great people and I just get super addicted to it. And I email the organized maybe like 10 times, can I organize it? Please let me in. So <laughs> finally, I just start organizing it and I love it really ever since then. And it's 54 hours of uh, craziness because you will need to validate, have an idea, pitch your idea, validate your idea, and work with developer, designer, get everything done. 
And I also have a family. I have a husband and five-year-old at home. And after that um, startup weekend, I think it was Saturday, I went home. I couldn't fall asleep. I just st I went home around 11 o'clock still thinking about how can I get that product validated and build it. So it's really addictive, but I strongly encourage you guys to sign up for it. And there's also another one. It's one and only from Columbus, Ohio. It's called Give Back Hack. And it's from amazing um, one and only, again, Susie Bureau. And she started and founded in Columbus. And now um, it's kind of global-ish, right? Worldwide. Yeah, it's in Columbus, um, Cleveland, Baltimore, and Thailand, right? And more, more coming. So it's definitely a lot of amazing things. Um, it's happening in the community. And definitely find me and talk to me afterwards. I will give you tons of stuff you can do outside of your work. Yeah, uh, Adam, can you expand on what your experiences with hackathons are? Sure. Um, I definitely don't have as much experience as her, but I have been to several startup weekends and other hackathons. And um, I would say the things that I worked on on those weekends were 100% terrible. I mean, it were just it, it just wasn't about the product. I mean, for me, at least. Maybe for some people it is. But it was about the networking and, like, being on a team and, like, you know, just, like, going at it all weekend, like, really hard. And I, I felt like that was by far the best way of networking for me. I mean, I'll go to meetup events and, you know, I'll try to make small talk with people and whatever, and I'm not very good at it because I'm, you know, kind of awkward. And, um, but then I go to one of these things and I'm like, you know, working on things and really excited about it. And I'm, I think that that shared struggle really leads to a lot of um, great, uh, you know, friendships and, uh, and networking opportunities. So that's what it's been about for me. Great. Um, so uh, kind of a, we're going to switch a little bit to trying to quicker responses. So kind of talking on hackathons, um, Timothy, uh, why is community important? Community is important because none of us can do any of what we do alone. Kyle. No, that was a fantastic answer. <laughs> we just weren't prepared for it. So from what I saw from making this documentary, community is important because really you need it to get things done. Everything that we pulled together within the film was all about how we can create a better community here to support startups and create an ecosystem that uses success to create more success. So a big part of community is mentors. So Laura, can you talk about mentoring and why it's important? Sure. No, I do want to give a little bit of a plug to Columbus Web Group. We tried a program that horribly failed. But um, there was a moment so bad. <laughs> where it was myself, Sean, and Kevin. And um, I was tasked with forming a mentorship program. And we all care about mentoring very much. I would say that we also are very addicting to helping people. I've actually started to create more space for myself and tell people no because it can be exhausting. But anyway, um, so even though there's like so many other entities in the city that will do a formal mentorship program, something like what we try to do at Columbus Web Group. And the reason why it failed, to be honest, is because we had, what, like 250 people wanting mentors. And we only had 15 people volunteer to be mentors. I mean, you do the math. So um, it was really overwhelming for me because I wanted to help all these people. And I had to tell everyone, like, wait till next quarter, we'll get some more people, <laughs> and like, it never worked. Um, but the reason why I want to talk about this is I think that there's this common misunderstanding that 
you need to be like 10 years into your career and um, you need to have all these accolades and all these things to be a good mentor. My best friends are my mentors, you know what I mean? Um, there's a lot of people and a lot of things that you can learn from your intern or from people that are younger than you or not as seasoned. Um, but I will kind of like leave you with this, and this has kind of been my rubric that has always helped me throughout my career is I have three different levels of mentors, right? And I'm sure everyone has heard this, but it's worth repeating. So I always have someone as my career is changing, but I always have a peer mentor. So someone who I think is my equal and just making sure that I'm keeping up with that person and we're bouncing ideas off of each other. The other person, the second one would be someone that I eventually want to take their job. So there's someone that I look up to and that's kind of where I'm pushing the mile for. Um, so that's another mentor of mine that I always will have in my pocket. Of, and that person changes over the years, but um, I'm always focusing on like, I'm going to take you out of your job, right? Um, and like, I want to do what you do. And then I think the third one is like truly just all about inspiration, um, more of like a unicorn person that isn't really real. And so that's why I shouted that earlier at Sean, like Sean is one of those people for me. He's um, like, just to bring that back up, we're talking a lot about Sean tonight, but honestly, he's the type of person they accidentally put product designer into his title. And so this man went out and bought eight books about product management and was like, I need to figure this out. Like, that's how attentive to detail he is. Um, so, yeah, I think taking that away, mentorship is really important. Uh, so, Ben, you, you work a lot uh, with you know, people in various stages of their career. Um, what do you think the, the importance of mentorship is um, in, in your sort of size company? Um, <clears throat> well, I would say a couple of things. Like if you've um, been listening to the conversation tonight, you've probably heard the thread of relationship, right? In everything that almost everybody has said, it's always been about, I think somebody even said, I've gotten all my jobs by somebody, I, by knowing somebody, you know? So certainly there's the connection of like a mentorship is an opportunity to very intentionally build a relationship. And the more of those you have, the more opportunities that you, you will be able to find. Um, but also one of the things that I've seen that's been really cool internally at Sparkbox is that, you know, we've been doing this apprenticeship program now for several years. And each year the curriculum changes a little bit. And what I've seen is that the folks who came through that process, who we chose to bring on as employees, are very excited about what, what's going to happen in that next uh, um, class. And so we're starting to see this. It's really cool that those folks who come through the program um, that we, we make, we extend an offer to, they, they then really sort of pour into that next group of folks. And it's a, it's this really neat cycle that started to happen. We were at a company retreat a year and a half ago and I, I wasn't planning on this, but I just was curious. And I said, how many of you came through our program? And it was almost 25% of our company now has come through this apprenticeship program, you know? So it, I was kind of blown away that that's what's happened, but it's only been that way because those relationships have really allowed folks to sort of have someone to pour into and to be poured into in some way. It's really been cool. Uh, so Timothy, you, you know, you're very passionate about the Columbus community. Um, so, you know, Sparkbox being out in Dayton and um, it's still sort of that Ohio, that Midwest thing. Can you, you talk a little bit about like, how the you, you feel the community is important and um so you know 25 percent of people are, are staying there at sparkbox so sort of talk about a bit about why community is important and like why people want to stay in columbus and the midwest yeah um so first off um dayton is an amazing city if you have not been out there go on out there it is a very quick drive it holds more patents per capita than anywhere and uh, it has always been an innovation city. Also, they've got a really cool arcade that two years from now, you are going to be taking all of your friends to. Um, Columbus, how do I put this? Columbus is a very unique city, even more so because of the geography that surrounds us. While the rest of the region is 
holding on to what they have and growing and figuring out different ways to ebb and weave, Columbus has a constantly growing and changing group of people that are interacting with it. When you're down in one of our sibling cities to the south, the first thing that they'll ask you is, what school did you go to? Because as soon as you answer that question, they're going to know a lot about you. And by what school, what high school? In Columbus, um, I'm, and, and quite a few of you, are, are the rare ones in the fact if we grew up here. Most of the folks that came here came here for school or came here because they wanted to move here. And a lot of people come here, leave, and come back. What's that? Yep, the Belco City. Um, but as Columbus is growing, I mean, we are Test City USA, as we saw in the documentary. Um, but we're also in such an amazing time where 15 years ago, our top entrepreneurs were restaurant owners. And some of my best friends that are entrepreneurs are restaurant owners, and that's amazing. But now we've got this group that we call our jewels, which are these venture backed or these community supported groups, the roots, the beams, the script drops, the shares that are getting these major eyes on them and are bringing these phenomenally talented people to the city uh, to, to take these jobs. And what I'm most proud of is before they're reaching out and saying, okay, we need to get all of this stuff from the coast and we need to get all these partners that, uh, that have never seen this before, they're saying, who in Columbus wants to come and play with us? And when you have someone who is from here or new to here or in school here that says, this is my dream job. I want to be that person and I want to be working with this person. They're ready and open to say, okay, let's take a meeting. Let's have a conversation. That's not true in every city which we work with. And that's definitely not true in a lot of cities that we work with. Uh, yeah, so Kyle, you came here as well to Ohio State. So that's a big draw. What, um, what is your advice to the community? Um, well, I think my advice for the community is just, and for those of you who saw the film, it's what came out from the people that we talked to, is really develop like this kind of friendly attitude here. I, I forget how it was said in the film, but essentially Columbus has the unique perspective of not being competitive in the sense that everyone is fighting over who gets what. Columbus is starting to develop this mentality of instead of it's me versus you, let's work together to create something better. And I think that's something that can be very important for the future of Columbus in creating a better community here. Just so you guys know, I'm not just like sitting here texting or like tweeting, I'm talking to Andy. So I feel like really awkward being on my phone here, but I'm talking to Andy quietly, so. And I'm trying to pay attention to yeah. too much at once. Are you, are you getting this? And I'm winking at him a lot. <laughs> I'm realizing <laughs> that's probably not coming across right up here, but. That's not you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I take a while to read. Okay, so we're going to switch it up a little bit um, and we're going to give, we're going to make sure we have everyone kind of have a chance to answer some of these uh, next questions. But we've talked a lot about um, Columbus and all of the, the good things about Columbus, but I'm, I'm interested in what you think Columbus struggles with and um, does Columbus struggle with diversity? And so I want to start with that question and we're gonna start with Ben and everyone is going to get a quick answer. So do you think Columbus struggles with diversity? I know that's kind of a bad question. Well, yeah, not just Columbus, the but night. maybe the uh, industry. Well, it's okay, I can yeah. answer that because I think every place struggles with this. So yes, um, do you want me to say more or is that it? <laughs> uh, keep going, Ben. Um, <clears throat> I think, uh, there's this thing that has to happen with every individual 
they have to sort of recognize that if diversity, equity, inclusion are not things that you're thinking about now, it's probably because you're so privileged that you don't have to think about it, right? And I think that's the experience that I've had at least, is that it, I, I grew up in a very, very privileged situation. And so I never had to think about those things. And it was only through some sort of um, relationships that I developed um, and through some introspection and a lot of reading and, and you know, some work just to try and understand that, that it kind of shook me a little bit to my core and, and I recognize that there's a lot of work that, that I need to do, you know? Um, and so I think the challenge with this is that it's not a thing that you can, you can't make somebody else experience that, right? People have to want that. They have to recognize that about themselves. And so I'm not quite sure how to, how to get folks to that point. Um, I would love to talk to you if you have ideas. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, I know that's something recently we've been trying to discuss even more you know, internally with our company, but like I said, we work with so many clients um, in Columbus, so making that part of the conversation of how are you hiring, um, what does your you know inclusion and diversity practice look like, um, making it you know more of an intentional conversation. So that's just something we've been trying to do with companies to better understand you know how they go about making their team you know more diverse, how they go about finding talent. Um, you know, obviously here in Columbus, but no matter what what city you're part of, I think that's important. Um, I think. What hits home most for me is that, you know, in Ohio, we don't have any protections for LGBTQ people. They can be fired at any time for, you know, being gay or being trans or having different gender identities. And so especially in workplaces, like how are we going out of our ways to out of the way to make sure that we're creating safe spaces for everyone? Um, just in my personal experience that is you know how are we introducing ourselves first with our pronouns so that everyone else in the room feels like they can feel comfortable to share their pronouns as well um, there are so many ways that you can um, invest into that specific type of equity and inclusion and even like at equitas health we have an entire institute training arm that you can bring into your company and they will actually teach you how to create those spaces so Okay, um, I'll be honest. So I think we kind of created this bucket of conversation piece because Kevin and I were texting um, when he asked me to be on this panel and I said, I was like, who else is on it? It's fine. Who else is on it? And he gave me three names and I know who all three of them are and they were all white dudes and I was like, I'm not doing it. And um, I was like, you were one of them. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, I know those are all of our friends, but like, they're also all white dudes. Um, so I think I could talk about this for hours, obviously, but do we have a problem? Yes. How do we solve it? Um, I'm very much on the stance that it's really up for a lot of white allies to do the work and not necessarily people that are of color. So that's one thing. And then the other thing is that what else did I say I was gonna say? Um, what was the, even the question? Like there's so much to talk about. Oh, is Columbus diverse-ish? It is, but the important thing to focus on is around wealth, um, the basic living wage in the city of Columbus, and then affordable housing. So I talked about it earlier. I'm on the Create Columbus Commission, and I've been exposed to a lot of different departments in the city of Columbus and different nonprofits, anything from evictions to um, just basic things from um, adults and families and children that are homeless. So everything around affordable housing touches everything from health care to living wage to school to a lot of different things and it's very complex and it's very um, Columbus raise your hand if you know this but Columbus is one of the most segregated cities in the United States okay um, how about what else is there to talk about how about just thinking about the tech space in general does what do you think is the percentage, I'll say, of retention for women of color in tech. And I'm talking, you studied it in school and you're retained after 10 years. 
So, um, and that's just in my industry, right? So the thing about it is, is there's a lot of complexities because we're built on a system that is meant to oppress people. And it's very uncomfortable to talk about. Um, and everyone wants to have safe space. But I think that it's about having uncomfortable conversations first to allow people to even be educated because not everyone in this room raised their hand. So um, there's a lot of work to do. I think what's really interesting is the tech space is clearly a huge divide for it. And like what I tell a lot of young kids is we make money in tech, baby. You know, like we have a real chance of making wealth in this industry, um, but it's not really clearly shared and I'll bring up one additional last point before I toast it over to Wolf, but we had a set of questions um, that we kind of reviewed as a panel, and one of them was like, can we talk about um, equal pay? And my response was the argument around equal pay is really dead. It's more about wealth because that's really where things are as you progress throughout your life. So equal pay can only help for so much. It's more about living wage, but how are things being stripped from people to have wealth and longevity for the long term. So just think about those things as you're having conversations. I do applaud for organizations that are intentionally thinking about it, but it's not talking about the root problem. It's just another process. Thank you. I, I do want to give a positive shout out uh, to the fact that from where we are right now, this is a diverse group. And you don't get that in every room. Uh, but I'm, I'm proud to be talking to a group of faces that don't look like me. Um, I, I will challenge everyone, and I'm not gonna ask for a show of hands, um, but most, most of the people in this room have never been south of 104. And for anyone who doesn't know, 104 is the 161 of the south side. It is a freeway that divides us from a quarter of the Columbus residents. And most of us have never been down there. Until we solve creating sidewalks and transportation, mobility, and programs like that for that quarter of our city, we're never going to actualize anything in downtown or in the tech industry or in any of the neighborhoods which we frequent the way that we do. Um, so in, in that, we are doing better, but we still have a really long way to go. So before um, our talk, Kevin actually warned us, we are not allowed to say, I agree with Laura, I agree with Tim. <laughs> but it's really hard to like not echoing them because as a first gen uh, generation immigrant myself, um, especially in tech space, Laura and I just talked about this um, before the panel. The challenge I face every day is very, very um, single point of view from um, why male not point a <laughs> finger, but it's really um, very sing singular view. That's what they thought, and a lot of times it's hard to ch very hard to change their view and share. Hey, there's a, another side of point that. What about um, different view? Con have you considered about another group? So um, I think it's really on point. Lots of us in a corporation, corporate America, we just think about what's the ratio, what's the numbers, what's the composition between black and white and Asian Pacific and um, others. So those are just numbered. We should really think about the deeper to how can we listen to another side of point, not thinking about just race, the color, um, how can we really listening to each other? And that's what I care about at workplace, to be honest. So that's my view. 
So I don't really have an answer on how we can fix any of this or what we can do. I haven't been here that long and I don't have a whole lot of experience with the issues that are facing this community. But I will say that I think the biggest question to be asking ourselves is as Columbus grows, as it becomes this amazing successful city that it's clearly headed towards, how do we raise up the people who are on the outskirts and not push them away? As the city grows and we see more and more wealth, how do we pull those people in instead of pushing them out? Uh, yeah, so I I'm, I'm, I really um, liked what everyone had to say. And I don't have a ton to add to it, but one, and, and this is more about the, the tech community than, than Columbus, um, but one thing I'm really excited about, and we kind of touched on this earlier, are like these new models of education and like developer boot camps and innovative education models that I think are going to bring in different types of people that wouldn't have gone down the traditional four-year college route that, that I went through. But I think over the next you know, decade or whatever, I think we're going to see a lot of transformation in that space. And that's going to bring in so many more people that, that wouldn't have been there otherwise. Some last one. Um... I would usually, uh, uh, for any kind of like issues or trying to solve anything, I mean, that's, we're just all on a couch, just happen to have microphones at this point in time. Um, but yeah, Laura, I would, I would defer most of my answers to her, or just like, I had to talk more about it, um, at like a broad scheme of things. Uh, but at a personal level, I know, like, uh, I've just, uh, been making sure to be a more concerted effort of just reaching out, you know, like personally mentoring people um, in the community, just uh, making myself more available to people that would probably be like, oh, uh, who is this person just randomly LinkedIn messaging me, um, just asking for help. Like, uh, I usually actually respond to most of them and say, yes, let's meet at some coffee shop at 7 a.m. Um, and 90% of the time they say yes, and I say, crap, I have to wake up at like 6.30. Uh, <laughs> um, so that's, that's what I know I, I do on a personal level. Um, and I've been doing it, I don't know, less uh, ever since, uh, I don't know, I've been consumed more on like personal like sanity, uh, depression, and anxiety. But as I've been overcoming that, I've been trying to get out more and more and helping out. Um, just anybody, everybody um, on like morning sessions of, hey, you want to get into this tech space? You don't know anybody, anything? Hey, now you know me. Um, and I happen to know other people who have gotten me, um, just vouched for me. And I hope to do the same thing just on a personal level, just vouching for people. Like, this is a good person. I, they've done good work. Or if they aren't good, like, hey, yeah, I don't know about this guy. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for sharing your perspectives. Uh, at this point, we would like to open it up to the floor to have anyone who wants to ask questions. Um, we ask that you do, if you are asking a question specifically, just address whoever, uh, whoever, whoever it is that you're asking a question so they know to answer. And it's not just a kind of a generic yeah. um, anyone on the panel. And if it is for multiple people, just like quick responses. We are over on time. That does happen. But uh, sorry about that. Hopefully you're still having fun. Uh, I am, as always. It's awesome. All right. um, we probably should do a microphone. Yeah. I'm not just going to stand up here awkwardly. I work for a company that claims we have tapped the greater Cincinnati area of developer talent, but when they say that, it implies that they're also saying there are no women nor developers of color in the greater Cincinnati area, given the people I work with every day. What can I do as a non-manager to have our hiring pipeline even begin to look at sources that aren't the same boring places that they claim are tapped out. I'm just assuming this is for me. Um, no, I'm kidding. Um, one thing that I do want to say, um, and this is like 
I should probably like trademark this or something, but I call it the homie effect. So your implicit bias will always, you will always recommend more times out of not, like nine times out of 10, someone that looks like you. So always challenge that. Like if you recommend a friend, maybe make sure he's not another white dude, you know? So um, I always like tell like my HR managers and things like that. I'm like, we should not be hiring for the homie effect. We should be hiring for talent. Um, so like be like, take that extra second to just be like, Hey, like we're looking for this. Who do I actually know that fulfills those requirements? And like, don't just recommend your friend. But Cincinnati has a pretty, has actually the strongest black tech, just black in general. I don't know. Like I'm also half Asian, so I don't know about everybody else, but um, Cincinnati actually has a really strong black tech community, um, way stronger than Columbus and Cleveland. Um, so they have groups, they have user groups, they have events, they do things. I'm not from Cincinnati, but what's that place where everybody like congregates and like Union Hall? People are kicking it there. And just um, the thing that I tell everybody is like, you got to meet people where they are. Like, it's very presumptuous and arrogant to assume that people will meet you where you are, right? So, like, just go ahead and meet people, your end users, your customers, people you're recruiting. It's the same philosophy as you're building software. Meet your user base where they are. Uh, Leslie Miley gave a great talk <clears throat> at Tech Inclusion a couple of years back, and he said, if you want to grow the diversity of your workforce, invest in communities where the folks you want um, to work on your teams live and work. And so that's a strategy that we've taken. It seems so simple, but it's not about changing your pipeline. It's about relationships. It's always about relationships. So in Cincinnati, there's a group called Blacks and Technology, which is probably part of what you were referring to. Greg Greenlee is the founder of this organization. He lives in Cincinnati. It's a national group, thousands and thousands of, of members. And um, I somehow bumped into him and was like, you know, so this is an, an organization for us that we've started to invest in. There's lots of organizations like this. So find those. And if you're going to sponsor a meetup, you know, the organization you work for, maybe su suggest a few local meetups that are focused on underrepresented groups. And maybe that would be a way to start building relationships with folks. New group in Columbus called Black Tech 614, I think. But they have a conference October 16th. I'm going to be speaking. I'm not sure what I'm going to be talking about yet. But um, like Script Drop, sponsored them and all the leadership in my company is white but you know what I mean it's like just finding those opportunities and like events like that that are going around in your city so in Columbus there's really only two groups like that so there's Black Hack as well um well there's probably more too but those are yeah that's yeah that's good that one actually just ended but that's more on the creative side like artists designers um videographers This question is for Sean. You've had a lot of different roles in design, which has led you to the project engineer, product engineer, engineer role. Yeah, I code things. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm 20 years in now, web design, um, little front end development, and I'm trying because the trend is taking me into UI UX space. Um, where I currently work allows me to go to conferences, allows me to take pluralsight classes, but what I lack is anybody in my space to brainstorm with, feed off ideas with. So I'm here, I go to conferences.
Yeah, just to clarify, so you're in the design or the? Well, I, yeah, I, I do wire printing on it. And I okay. Branding, I personally identify all of the like, why personally, but I don't know if yeah. Yeah. And uh, to repeat the question, just because I think your microphone died, uh, it was, uh, it's okay. It's easy enough with their machines. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a, if you, who here is in like the design E, UI, UX E? Cool. Um, so you have other people to talk to. Hey, awesome. you can keep your hands raised. Um, also me. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's, it really comes down to um, lots of, if you are looking at other jobs or just looking at other things, uh, the, the title is really, I don't know, it could be anything. And then the job description could be listing like a whole laundry list of stuff. Um, and it goes, into like what they're actually looking for compared to just what they wrote down or found on the internet. Um, so there is a, a, a good thing. Have you ever seen like the, the UX umbrella or the UI? Um, okay. I've studied, I've studied a yeah, lot no, on I, it because I want to desperately get into it. So, so okay. Uh, yeah, so th for those, those that don't know you know, don't know is UX is like just a really blanketed term and there's like eight different sections that you can do within it. Um, so you can have one person that does each of them or you can do a combination. Um, but in, to get into it, it from doing like more of the UI branding and uh, wireframing aspect, I, I, I guess it would just depend on like creating, uh, if you are trying to get a job in that realm, creating projects yourself that you're trying to get into or uh, going to like one of the startup weekends, um, just to have like an example project, and then you can work on it more after you're done. Um, that's what I did with some of my stuff, um, just to get like that practice and the repetitions in of that. So create something amazing that gets noticed above everybody else. <laughs> okay, awesome, I'll work on that. Yeah. <laughs> no, okay. thanks for the advice, I appreciate I'm, it. I'm, I'm gonna give it unsolicited advice because that's what I do and I've Thank not done you. enough tonight. I barely know what UX and UI are, but I know that I and our clients use them all the time. And they need them even more. But they don't have the terminology. They don't, they don't know what it is. So being able to lay it out and say, I can do this thing that will make this look and feel better for your clients might be a way to get some pretty cool projects that don't know to list themselves as that project. And to add like where those terms came from, it was all derived from like user centric design and they're made up terms. And like myself and a bunch of my friends that were focusing on both uh, interactive design, the UI side plus the metric side and making things that are performant, we're like, what do we call it? And the form, the term user experience came up, and then like the umbrella helped define it. It didn't really mean anything. And then like I went started having like back end people and UX practices. I started helping corporations make UX practices. And I looked back and I was like, we made a really horrible decision on doing that. And bucketing people that thought about the customer first or, were then kind of a shared service as opposed to the back-end developer that was a part of the team that was thinking about the user that was influencing the people around them. And so when anyone comes to me and they were like, hey, I want to get into UI, UX, I'm just like, oh, what do you, what do, you do, design? Do you do front-end? Do you do back-end or whatever? And it's just talking about the views of it and like what you're interested in and just think about what it means to, ex to the user and the data that you can gather around them. But we can talk more afterwards. Yeah. You have a question? And we're going to really have time for two more questions. I don't know why I did that. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, hi. I'm a student at OSU. And I'm working on getting into UI, UX, whatever that may be. Um, 
but I've been getting into more of the competitions like hackathons and different like rapid prototyping competitions. And I was wondering if there are benefits, like extra benefits to being part of organizing them versus just taking part in the event itself and networking that way. So as an organizer, you don't actually get to participate in a team competition, right? So, um, but the networking is definitely there. You will get to experience how to lead a team. And on top of the organizer, we also have different chair and committees, and you will get really hands-on into leading a team. So it's kind of like project management skill as well. And network aspect of it, we reach out to a lot of community sponsors, and you get to know people in a community really well. So I would say that's definitely the benefit. And during the day of the events, you get to network with participants as well, and mentors and judges as well. I'll just hop in there real quick. I've organized like 350 conferences, lots of different things. And people that are on my team, like if they're looking for a job, I might not have ever worked with them professionally, but I'll always recommend them because like doing that on the side of like having a job and all these things, like it's another way for someone to recommend you for a job. So I would almost rather be an organizer sometimes uh, than someone that participates. I think like when you're first in your career, it's good to participate. But once you get like a little bit more, you know, uh, your sea legs aren't really there anymore. Organizing is a better way for you to, like she was saying, meet sponsors and like totally different walks of life and a lot of different people. So every every team that's doing a project like a startup week or a, a startup weekend or three day startup is built on three basic pillars. It's uh, you need teammates who have time, talent, and treasure to be able to do it. You're at an amazing point in your career to be able to give a little bit of time to learn what they're working on and then be able to decide as you're developing your talent, if that's the direction you want to go or if you want to focus on working with those sponsors, bringing in the money, doing all that. There are immense benefits with any direction you go, but this is one of the only points where you're going to really have the time to be able to make those decisions before you have to just accept one. Cool. Uh, I'm actually going to steal the last question, if that's okay. Uh, it's one that we we had as a prepared question, uh, but I'll say the question. Then I'm going to make a few announcements, so then I don't do that awkward thing where everyone like claps and I'm like, "Hold on, one more thing." Uh, so the the question is uh, for all the panelists to say as quickly as they can or as briefly as possible what is your best career advice that you have to anyone in this audience and aimed at pretty much at any point in that career. So that's going to be the question. I know you guys have seen that question. Think about it for a second and then I'm going to make some announcements. So afterwards is the after party. Andy, where are we going? Uh, great question, Kevin. Where are we going? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was thinking 16 bit, uh, or what is does that sound fine? Sure. Yeah. Dirty Franks can't only fit like five people. Dirty Franks is awesome. So 16 bit, which is literally just down the street, there's free arcade games. It's a great spot to socialize, play some video games, and meet some new people. Um, if you are new to Columbus Web Group and you haven't met myself or Andy, please just come up and say hi. Uh, we try to meet everyone that comes to these meetup group meetup events. And if you are new here and you don't know anyone and you came here with someone that you do know, please make an effort to try to meet someone new tonight. Uh, this room is full of some really, really amazing people. Uh, the people that I don't know, I look forward to meeting you. Uh, but please make an effort. That's why we put on these events. It's a huge piece of the Columbus Web Group and the culture that we have here. So that's all I have. And thanks for everyone for coming out. and. Back to the last question, so career advice. Ah, this is, uh, all right. Um, I, I'm really bad at answering questions, especially on spot and especially on stage. Um, can you stand up? Oh, I, I can't stand up. <laughs> 
I just feel like I'm a fire hose of stuff uh, rather than any kind of smart answer. So I'll pass until it comes back. <laughs> uh, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, so just generic best career advice I can think of. Um, I feel like the best career advice is like the most obvious stuff. It's just like, oh, work hard, you know, go to school, etc. I think a more unique piece of advice that I think, and I, I kind of thought of it earlier because of something Laura said about moving around between jobs, but I think when you're earlier in your, your career, I think quitting is a little underrated. Like, if you're not in the right spot, go find something else that you should be doing that you're passionate about. It, you know, even if your resume looks a little bit, you know, random, it, it's worth moving around and finding that thing you're passionate about. I know so many of my friends who are, I don't know, in their 30s, and they hate their jobs and they hate their industry, but they can't switch because they'd have to take a huge pay cut. And you don't want to be that person. And so, like, just at the beginning, keep, you know, keep moving around until you find something that you love. I would just say that everyone should try and take big risks. I know, at least for me, this summer, uh, I signed up for an internship with Jay Klaus to make this film, and the job description was garbage. They had no idea what they were talking about. None of the terms they used were even remotely correct in terms of film and what they wanted. And the job description was, let's make this film where you talk to some random people. And I said, I'd love to get paid to do that, but if I'm going to do that, I don't want to waste my whole summer making a shitty film said, you have connections in this community, let's make the best film that we can possibly make. So I'd say take the risk and then do everything you can to make it the best opportunity. So since we are all in Columbus, I, I would suggest you to leverage your community, connect with each one of us, reach out, but also definitely keep your promise. If you reach out and you promise somebody you're going to show up, please be respectful and show it up. So reach out to your community and keep your promise. Uh, the best advice I ever received and I think about it every day is um, do big shit and don't fuck it up. That's a Mike Brown quote, <gasps> if any of you know him. Oh my God, I can't handle that. Um, I'm trying to think about like when I was really young and what worked for me then that still works for me now or I can credit to where I am today. And so for me, um, I'm very, very, very protective of my space and who I talk to and who I spend my energy with. Um, so I have a completely irreplaceable network of people. A lot of those people are in this room right now. And just know that if I've met with you, it means that I like have some like real love for you in some way. Um, but with that said, is I built a network with a lot of clear intention. So when I was in college, if I met someone and we just vibed, I would ask them to introduce me to three other people that they thought that I would like. And immediately, if I knew that we wouldn't vibe, um, I wouldn't meet with them or I wouldn't like go out of my way just to meet coffee with them. Like I can genuinely look at my network of people and consider them all my friend. And I would do anything for any of them. I don't care what your status is or what you've achieved, if I can't have a beer with you, um, we're not going to vibe and it's not going to be great energy for me. So that is definitely my best advice. Is protect your energy. Wow. Well, uh, <laughs> came from every side. Um, I think my only uh, advice would be if you want to do something, just tell everyone and put it out into the universe because you'd be amazed how it just comes right back to the thing that you thought was completely impossible to achieve. And someone's like, blah, I know how to do that. And you're like, whoa, let's do it. So. Um, I would say just being intentional with your goals, whether it's personal, what you want out of life or professional. So you can kind of have those gut checks sometimes if it is, hey, I'm ready for a new job. This is not you know, the direction I wanted to go or internally, you know, with a company, um, you kind of need to, you know, have a, good goal of what you want out of 
out of a career so you can course correct. And then I would say just keep being uncomfortable, put yourself in uncomfortable situations to keep growing. Um, I think you'll, you'll get where you want to go. I would say um, stay in learning mode. <clears throat> and I mean that in every interaction that you have, don't approach even a single conversation trying to educate. Instead, if you're the one who's like looking to learn and try to pull information out of folks, what you'll find is that um, those conversations will be much more natural and you get to know people actually on a personal level. And that comes back to the whole networking thing, which leads to lots of opportunities. So stay in learning mode. Sean. Yeah, you've had a lot of time, Sean. <laughs> oh, this one's different. Um, yeah, so I guess this is directed to people that are weird. Um, so if you're weird, uh, this should hopefully help. Um, so I, I watched this, it's like a really rudimentary, odd, short video um, animation called Who I Am and What I Want by David Shrigley. Um, I don't know why it, it, it made me question myself um, and things like who I am and what I want, um, but it did. Um, so I recommend watching that if you are weird and you're trying to get somewhere different or just understand yourself better. That's all I got. A big round of applause for everyone. So if you didn't get a chance to ask your question, the panelists will be around. And also, we'll be at 16-bit later tonight. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys for coming out tonight. I know everyone has busy schedules, so I appreciate your time and being a part of this community.